I want you to imagine a challenge. Imagine yourself being assigned in that classroom context with a blank sheet of paper. And what I want you to imagine, you don't have to literally do it, but I want you in your mind's eye to accept an assignment to create a genealogy. You can do it from fiction if you like. Um, and, but I want the number of words that you're going to end up using to be divisible by seven. In other words, if you take, well, however, when you finish making your little genealogy, if you count the words and divide by seven, there should be no remainder. Not, in other words, I want you to have your, your assignment a multiple of seven exactly. How many could do that? It's not hard to do, especially in English. You can fudge it around, okay. Except I got another uh, uh, condition I want you to meet. I want the number of letters that you use, if you count them up, to be div divisible by seven exactly. Now that's a little tougher, isn't it? Because you might get the words to come out, but you need to get the letters to come out. But by fudging around, you could probably do that. Except I, have an, I want the number of vowels and the number of constants each to be a num multiple of seven. How many are still playing with me? Okay, well, I've got some additional rules I want your assignment to meet. I want the number of words that begin with a vowel to be divisible by seven. I want the number of words that begin with a consonant to be divisible by seven. And I have some other things. I want the number of words that occur more than once to be a multiple of seven exactly. And I'd like to have those that occur in more than one form to be divisible by seven. And those that are in only one form divisible by seven. How many are still playing? Okay, you realize every time I impose another sevenfold rule, you've got six chances of losing and one of winning just by randomness. You with me? Okay. The number of nouns should be divisible by seven. Only seven words won't be nouns. And the number of names should be divisible by seven. Only seven other kinds of nouns are permitted. Anyone still playing? Okay. And so what you probably, some other things here. The number of male names divisible by seven, number of generations. And you've probably guessed what I'm doing here. I'm describing to you the genealogy of Jesus Christ in the first 11 verses of the Gospel of Matthew. They meet all those rules. Now you can't imagine doing that yourself. And I'm talking about Greek, which is rigid. Every Greek verb has to meet five conditions. It's much more structured than our English that we're used to. And uh, so uh, the, the precision, the, the, what I'm trying to get across is that we discover as you investigate the text, it has properties that are not simulatable. Trying to do that even with the aid of a computer is a ver almost impossible task. See, Greek also is one of the two languages, there's two languages that have a numerical value for every letter in their alphabet. Hebrew and Greek have that peculiar characteristic. That means that every word has a value. They call it the geometrical value. And we could go through this of the rest of chapter one and find it still obeys dozens of these sevenfold challenges. I won't go through them all here, but almost every characteristic you measure turns out to be a number that's an exact multiple of seven. Now, the child of Christ in Matthew two, same also fits all of that. And we could go on and on about this. The chances of these things happening by statistical accident are phenomenally unlikely. If I just have two of these, if I have one uh, rule of seven, you've got six chances of losing, one of winning, right? But if I have two rules, that's one chance in seven squared or 49. In other words, you have, by randomness, you have one chance in 49 of it coming out the way you want it. You with me? And if I have three of those, it's one chance in 343. See, it's always the the exponent of the number you're looking at. And so if I have four, it's two, 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 it's, you have one chance in 2,400 of getting it by just statistical accident. And so if you go down this list, I've given you nine rules so far. Those nine rules mean that you have one chance in 40 million of having it come out right by just statistical accident. You know, once you understand the, the, the statistical behavior, the more rules there are, the more unlikely it is to come about by anything other than deliberate design. And so, and uh, if you'd like to try this, let's assume you say, well, I can try to do that. If I've got to do that, if I worked eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, that's 2,000 man hours a year in effect, and uh, in seven to nine chances means I've got to have 40 million attempts to try to get it by randomness. 
if I can do, it takes 10 minutes at a time to write one of these genealogies, then uh, it, 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 that would take 400 uh, million minutes or over 3,000 years. But it gets worse than that. That's just a quick approximation. Let's look at further. If I go on with these words, these, these rules, it turns out that I can give you actually 34 of these. And that's one chance in oodles. Okay. <laughs> and so if you still want to try doing this mechanically, and that means you got 7 to the 34th power, that's 5 times 10 to the 25th tries would be needed. And there are three times 10 to the seventh tries in seconds per year. Let's assume you had a supercomputer that would do 400 million of these per second. How long would it have to work? It still would have to work over four times 10 to the 12th computer years. In other words, I, if it had a million of these supercomputers, it still would take over four million years. I think it's a cross that it's not the, this is not something that could happen by randomness. And uh, so, and this was only with 34. Dr. Ivan Panin, on whose research this, who discovered these things, he identified 75, not 34 rules, and that goes beyond our imagining. Dr. I uh, Ivan Panin, born in Russia back in 1955, ex exiled in early age, he got involved in a plot against the Tsar, emigrated to Germany and then the U.S. He graduated from Harvard in 1882. And interestingly enough, he discovered Christ. Now, every one of us in this room that has discovered Christ are the result of a miracle. But if you've got a PhD in, from Harvard, that's a bigger miracle. Okay. <laughs> and so, but he also discovered early in his career the, the, what he calls the heptatic structure of the scripture. And back in 1890, actually, he committed the rest of his 50 years of his life, generating over 43,000 pages of discoveries very dry reading, but staggering in their implications. Because it, among other things, it tells you there are all kinds of properties of the Torah that depend on the precise letters that you're using, which tells you not only did God give Moses the Torah, he gave it to Moses letter by letter. You pull one letter out of that and some of those properties start to dissipate. Staggering, staggering implication to an information scientist. And so, but I want to mention just one of these that to me is the most staggering of them all. The New Testament consists of 27 books. That means they, they have a word that starts them and a word that ends them. And if there's 27 books of the New Testament, then you've got uh, 54 words, okay? And so there's a total vocabulary of those words that happen to be 28 words in the Gospels. And uh, so if you go through all this arithmetic, the shortest word, the longest word, all that sort of thing, each one of those are multiple of seven. But here's the one that's interesting to me. The vocabulary in the Gospel of Matthew that is unique to the Gospel of Matthew happens to be a multiple of seven. It occurs 42 times, that's seven times six. It has a 226 letters, that's 7 times 18. And that's un the only property that these words have is that they are unique to the Gospel of Matthew. And they come out precisely as a multiple of 7. You with me so far? My question is, gee, that's interesting. Um, how could that have been organized? Let's imagine that Matthew deliberately tried to make it come out that way. How would you go about doing that? There's only two ways you could do that. One is you could have all the other authors of the New Testament agree not to use those, those words. How many think that happened? I don't think so. Well, the other way, you could use that argument linguistically to prove that Matthew must have written his last. That's the only way he could preserve that property, right? So I could use that as an argument, at least, that Matthew wrote his document last. Well, that's pretty interesting. So, Gospel of Matthew wrote his last, except I discover that when I look at the Gospel of Mark, it has the same property. That the words that are unique to the Gospel of Mark are a multiple of seven exactly. That proves that Mark was written last. Well, no, wait a minute. If I look at the Gospel of Luke, it also has that property. That the words that are unique to his writing in the New Testament those words, there's the number of words that are unique to him, 
are a multiple of seven exactly. That proves that Luke wrote his last, except so did John. Each one of these wrote their last. In fact, so did James, Peter, Jude, and Paul. Each wrote last. Each one of their writings, the collective writings, has a vocabulary unique to them. Staggering. Staggering. You can't prove the Bible. Yes, you can. The more you know about the information sciences, the more you discover that we're dealing with something that is supernatural. That is supernatural. 